recorded in the beautiful mountains of British Columbia. Welcome to Friends, Friends on, on Horses. Horses. Uh, welcome back to Friends on Horses. Today we get to talk to Leah Hope, Program Director of Little Oasis Equine Assisted Learning. Leah works with adults and youth to develop life skills and social skills. Leah also cares deeply about the health of her horses and is a local go-to for advice about horse wellness. Leah sells equine supplements through her website, littleoasisequine.com. We're excited to talk to Leah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me, you guys. Um, I wanted to start off. Um, I feel bad taking this question because often this is Mira's question. Um, uh, but I wanted to ask about um, your journey into horses and then into um, uh, equine assisted learning. So how did that all kind of take place, start, evolve? Give us the, give us your story. Well, um, I was a late bloomer, as they say. Um, I was a mad, mad uh, teenager about horses and never actually got a chance to have a horse of my own. Mm -hmm. I was the sad kid that had the bridle, the bucket, the brushes, the saddle, but never actually got to own my own horse. <laughs> And then early, well, mid-teens, my parents separated and, and a different path was, was um, in my journey. I came back to horses uh, 32 or 33 years old mm -hmm. after I became a nurse and I had a career and I was married and I just had a baby and it was my time to get back into horses. And I started to, you know, uh, be attracted to horses in fields and and get to know the people who own the horses and I became involved with a horse whose owner had, was leaving the country uh, for a year on a, a working trip I guess and so I became attached to this horse and and the horse became attached to me and as they say the rest was um, irreversible for both of us <laughs> and so he came into my life uh, in 2001 and then uh, I purchased him uh, July 10th, 2002, actually transacted the money. Mm. So that was my journey back into horses and I was pretty green and, and didn't really know a lot of things. Um, but he was my teacher and um, he was my teacher in many respects for the next um, probably 10, 12 years. Well, one of my teachers because you can't just stop at one. Never. <laughs> so um, from a horse standpoint, I started with one on somebody else's property, but I was quickly very um, directed to a property of my own. And, and then it's not just one because you can't just have one horse. Then you have two. And, and then in 2005, there was a large scale a rescue in the area 29 horses and, and uh, geese and and um, donkeys and chickens and um, it was very cold it was January and the horses were in considered dire situation so we found out many of the horses and fed the ones that were left and had a, a bit of a large-scale rescue for our area yeah. and I ended up with two of the horses from that property off right off the bat and then a third came a year later which started my herd <laughs> so and now i'm i'm at a lot well i don't personally own six horses and we have eight horses here for program use so wow. that's kind of how the whole thing started yeah they find you <laughs> they do they really, sometimes it's like, oh man, another one found me. Dang it. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've been, had the pleasure of having many find me and, and it's also created, contributed to my learning about how to care for them because mm -hmm. when you start with rescue horses, um, rescue horses have a unique uh, history and not all of it is aware and they're digestive and they're emotional and all of their aspects of the their care becomes something that needs to be rehabilitated, mm -hmm. yeah. which leads us into, you know, why is the rehabilitation for horses and the rescuing for horses um, so important to the human development? Because a lot of humans also require some of those same elements that 
contribute to their healing and wellness in life. So that, um, that probably helps some of the people that you work with uh, because they can relate a little bit to these other creatures. Do they connect with that? Do they realize that when, when, you're, when they're working together? Oftentimes, there are some situations that we don't say a whole lot about the horse's histories mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. One, it could be a trigger. Um, and we, you know, we may not want to use the triggers. Um, but the other reason is too, is that we get an opportunity to see into the individuals by the horses that they're attracted to because they're often have similar histories. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hmm. So for instance, one of our mares we had, um, she was a mom and she had a traumatic birth and um, her last foal uh, was born under traumatic situations and she was very sick and she was very unwell. But we often find that the kids who have had fractures in attachment syndrome and in, in their younger years with a mother figure will be attracted to that horse. Okay, so that gives wow. us very valuable insight from a facilitation standpoint of how we might be able to help them and, and what facilitation skills and tools we're going to draw from to help that particular individual. Hmm. Another one of our horses is an incredibly sensitive mare. Um, oftentimes the people that are drawn to her are the ones that would be vulnerable to bullying within friend groups in, in school. Interesting. Hmm. Particularly girls. Hmm. Um, and we not always, right? Um, we also find other people that are particularly empathic in there and sensitive would be attracted to that horse as well. So it's not necessarily that profile, mm -hmm. but it also helps us determine our facilitation skills and what we're going to draw from to be able to help that individual learn the social skills or their their human development, how we can help them. Hmm. So it, it really depends. So we don't often bring their histories to the forefront. Hmm. It's fascinating. Very, yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it is really cool. And so when did you come to discover equine assisted learning? That's another really good question. <laughs> uh, in 2002, the day that I exchange the money for my for mingo was also the day that i was injured at work mm. the exact same day i went home that day injured from work and um which ultimately has changed my life wow. i didn't do that at the time i went ahead and bought the horse because there was nothing going to change that and which set me on a on a two-year path of extreme well injuries re-injury, um, physical challenges, and I couldn't ride. Mm. And everything that I did was I, I would still hang out with the horse. I would still learn the things I needed to learn, but wondered at one time, it was suggested to me at one time that I may never ride again. And it was also suggested to me that um, in five years, I may be in a wheelchair. Wow. That was, I want to say that was around late 2005, early 2006. Mm -hmm. I suffered the first injury in 2002 and the second injury in 2005. Mm -hmm. So it, the complexity, and I ended up with degenerative disc disease as well as um, chronic pain and then the emotional, psychological um trauma that all of that endured so knowing that i would never ride again and, and having the horse of my dreams for the first time mm -hmm. in 34 years when i when it came time to start looking at things i wanted something that i would be able to do and be able to offer regardless of my physical condition mm -hmm. so that's what shaped the decision around equine assisted learning versus other modalities mm -hmm. now you the natural question is what are the other modalities well we know about therapeutic riding yeah. um therapeutic yeah. riding is adapting a sport of riding to rider based goals 
Mm -hmm. So, um, whereas hippotherapy is occupational therapy goals or speech language goals using the horse as a tool. Okay. That's the difference between hippotherapy and therapeutic riding. Mm -hmm. And equine assisted learning allows us the opportunity to advance or enhance social skills and not, and not necessarily therapy mm. from a therapeutic goal. We can all use social skills advancements mm. and enhancements because with the cell phone and technology, oftentimes we're living a life that's devoid of tone or we're creating tone where there isn't any. Mm -hmm. And so that's a that's a human adult professional challenge. I remember my my doctor um, at the time, bless her heart, said I could send you a few surgeons to work with. And she's right. We we all have to be cognizant of mm -hmm. uh, the communication and the sum of the communication that we deliver and receive. Yeah. Very very interesting. Um, um it's uh, i'm going to go back a little bit here i i liked um what you said about how you found equine assisted learning and i find it interesting that you had all of these pieces happening at the same time for you you had your 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 um uh the physical component and the psychological component um and then that drove you in towards it sounds like to me um working through these big issues with your your clients who come to get help from you yeah. pretty special pretty interesting path you know yeah those who know me and have known my path have said the same thing it, you were meant to do this but how you got there was very sad and very challenging mm -hmm. i was injured in 2002 2005 again and i've and I tried to go back to work eight times. Wow. Mm -hmm. And along with that came um, battles with workman's compensation, insurance, my employer, mm -hmm. um, CPP, disability. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the battle or the fight was 10 years in duration. Wow. So. Yeah. Um, in 2000 and five years after my original injury in 2007, I realized that my condition was lifelong. At that point, most of the battle was to try and restore, to get back to what I was or, or I was expected to heal. Mm -hmm. And in 2007, I realized that I needed to make the best out of what I had. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, I was on significant amount of medication. Um, I have a list. Um, three different antidepressants, antispasmodics um, to stop the muscle spasms, mm -hmm. muscle relaxants, uh, pain control of various different um, narcotics and non-narcotics, anti-inflammatories and the whole gamut. Mm -hmm. And I have a, you know, I have a, you know, that turning point in my life, the dogs were barking in the middle of the night and I'd gotten up to deal with what was happening with the dogs. And I hit the top stair of a flight of stairs and I went down the stairs and I able to reach back and grab the top stair. And I hung there hmm. drugged and, and dazed in the middle of the night. And I thought, if this is my life, let me off. Hmm. Right. I was a mother. I, I was a wife. I was so many things, but this was not how I wanted to live my life. Mm -hmm. And so I started at that point to say, if I'm going to move over from the passenger seat into the driver's seat, where am I going? Mm -hmm. And I said, the first place I'm going is off all these drugs. <laughs> because I wanted, if I was going to be living chronic pain, mm -hmm. I was going to live it with being able to be at least real. Yeah. and present because I was not present right and so off the drugs I came it took me about a year and a half to get off all the drugs um, very slowly of course because at that point you know, a lot of drugs and you come off antidepressants and things too fast it can create a, 
big problem. And, mm -hmm. and I have to say, for the most part, it was against medical advice. They, they thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. I've been accused that a number of times. <laughs> and I will be again. Anyway, <laughs> um, they just didn't think that I should come off all the drugs. And I said I didn't want the life that I was leading. I didn't want to be in a daze. There would be times where I would meet people and I didn't know who they were, where I was, how I met them. There was times I couldn't pick up my daughter at skating or at the arena because I'd had too much, not enough, mm -hmm. couldn't do my shoulder check. It was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the life I wanted to lead. Mm -hmm. and so in 2007, off I came of all the drugs into 2008. And I started to wake up. Mm. And I decided, well, what was I going to do with the rest of my life? I was young, relatively young to be losing my career. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I had a, a well-paying job. Mm -hmm. Right, I was an operating room nurse and I also did stuff in emergency nursing and I had done home care nursing and I'd done nursing up in the First Nations communities. Mm. I'd also done one of my uh, positions was hospice and palliative care after I was originally injured. Mm. So it was a natural fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a absolutely a natural fit. Yeah. All my experience had kind of prepared me sort of for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What a what a huge toolkit you have. Yeah. Now doing the work that you that you do. I mean, not always fun acquiring those tools, of course, no. <laughs> right? But a huge toolkit. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. And I think that you know, and like I said, there's a silver lining all, always, and I like to see it that way. But it also, when it came time to start looking at how I was going to be able to trans transfer my skills, mm -hmm. equine assisted learning was a better fit in all the equine assisted um, professions or modalities that are out there today. Mm -hmm. And so what does it take to actually become certified as an equine assisted um, learning facilitator? Is there um, like a training process that you go through? Um, just what were the next steps after you made that decision? Well, after I made the decision that that was the natural fit was an unmounted, so not on the horse's back, Mm -hmm. less equipment that you're going to have to move around because again yeah. here's somebody with a back and um again a collaborative effort that you could have several people helping you in that environment Be, um there's there's uh trainings available within equine assisted learning and you'll find them um egala is a big common so the equine association of growth and learning association mm -hmm. Um, they are international, um, but they didn't, it didn't necessarily speak to me, uh, that organization. Um, so when I did the research, I thought, I don't know that it, it's really something that I feel comfortable that I'd be able to, to do. Mm -hmm. Um, Cartier Equine Assisted Learning um, education was out of Saskatchewan. It was developed out of First Nations communities and, mm. and youth programs. It morphed into bigger programs. That was my, uh, that was what I had found out at the time. Um, that fit for me. Mm -hmm. um, there are others now that have come up and there was some then out of the states and Path International also has a a wellness or a, an unmounted component. Um, natural lifemanship is another one that I've heard of. Epona out of, I believe out of Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, each one of them have pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. And with my skill set, what seemed to fit for me was the equine assisted learning Canadian based out of Saskatchewan with Cartier, now called Cartier Farms. Mm -hmm. um, then when I took the training, it was a seven week program and it was just shy of $7,000. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. And so that was in 2011, I took the training and, um, th since then, um, the Cartier equine assisted learning was originally created by three women mm -hmm. and their 
and their spouses who all were very involved in various capacities in the horse industry. A couple of years ago, the partnership dissolved, left two of the partners together and one went off on her own. So the two partners together stayed in, in Saskatchewan and they're what's known as Cartier Farms. Okay. So those two ladies uh, um, have continued with facilitator training programs and they've revisited the curriculum and they now deliver it over one week. Um, and I think there's six or seven modules. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then so, um, and then plenty of exercise practice, theory, facilitation styles, techniques, how to run the exercises, the various uh, phases within the exercise, like um, the briefing, and the debriefing and the actual core of the exercise and what are some of the things that you should see and it's it's a curriculum mm -hmm. and now it runs about forty five hundred dollars and we run certified training programs here we invite the two ladies to come and run them here mm -hmm. and certify um people that are interested in doing it prerequisites uh I don't think there are any because everybody's going to shape their program with what experience has brought them to it. Mm -hmm. I shape my program with the experience that brought me to it. Mm -hmm. And it is what it is. And I think that all those things that I've done in my past have shaped the program based on my experience. Hmm. Wonderful. Um, before we started recording, and this kind of ties into talking about kind of, you know, the how and what of EAL. Um, uh, you mentioned um, social development program, and I would love to have you expand on what that really means. Um, it is something that we're constantly working with in our community because a lot of people are still calling what we do equine therapy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, professionally, I don't like calling what we do equine therapy. And those of us who have horses would, would argue that anything having to do with horses is therapy. <laughs> no argument there. But <laughs> with, with respect to all the therapists and the therapies that are delivered by bona fide, uh, professional, educated, and, and um, people who have memberships to organizations and insurance, um, no disrespect to them, this is why we don't do therapy uh, as a label. Therapy really, depending on where it comes from, whether you're talking to a physical therapist, a, a PT, they're, develop, they're giving you physical therapy. So they are trained in that modality and that's what they give you, um, counselors and all those things. Because we're certified and we're not, uh, we don't have advanced level education in university and said things. I really shy away from the word therapy. But we are, and all us horse people will say, wait a second, they're horses. <laughs> and yes, I do. There is therapeutic value and therapeutic uh, milieu, which is the place that offers therapy based things and on a farm, and all those things have therapeutic value. But what we, we don't offer therapy unless we have a trained therapist in the pen with us. And we do do that. Huh. We do have clients that come with their uh, clinical uh, professional that come in the pen and they do work with us that way. Um, their goals are specific, related to their history. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we're not always privy to, but like we talked about with the horses, sometimes I we see things that the their of how they approach the horse and which horses they approach and why that can help the therapist expand on what it is they do. Mm -hmm. So back to the social skills then. Social skills are communication, articulation, body language, uh, boundary setting, being able to set appropriate boundaries, personal accountability, which in this mm -hmm. time of, of what's going on in the world, personal accountability is very important. It's a yeah. social skill. Mm -hmm. uh, problem solving. Um, all those are social skills. And regardless of where you come from, whether or not you're a surgeon like my doctor suggested, or whether or not you're a human that relies generally on a computer and email written word, or you're, 
you have a mental health background and challenges, your social skills become very important because you need to be able to say to somebody, you know, I'm not comfortable with this situation right now. I need to remove myself from the situation. That's communication. Mm -hmm. And active listening is being able to hear that and say, oh, okay, well, thank you for keeping yourself safe and what's important to you and not taking anything personally. That's a social skill. Mm -hmm. So that's where it's very important to define the distinction between social development and being offering an equine therapy. So the, the words are used interchangeably and we also, the stigma around calling therapy, we've had kids that say, I'm not going to therapy. <laughs> right? Because, ah. right. So we found that, I think it was three or four years ago that one of the kids said that and I said, you know how to hear it. This isn't therapy, hmm. right? So we really have tried to make a conscious effort at clarifying that because for one, it's part of what human development is. Mm -hmm. you know, we used to do it on the playground before cell phones. Now a lot of it is nonverbal and tone and all those things, but mm -hmm. horses will call you on that stuff. Yeah. And they should be allowed to call you on that stuff and for you to be able to reflect on it. Wow. And we don't reflect as often as if it's delivered from another human or if it's delivered from a horse. Hmm. I love that, Leah. Really interesting. Um, I'm curious, and I know it's hard because it would differ totally or potentially differ, I don't know, um, um, between sessions, but what are some of the key components or what are some, if you could paint our listeners a little bit of a picture as to what um, one of these sessions might look like or entail, uh, the thought that you're putting into it, um, that would be fantastic. Okay. Um, so we mostly handle groups or small groups. We, we have had a private one-on-one, um, -on -one, but those are typically not our usual. We usually have groups, we have families, and we have the youth group is, you know, could be six, eight, or ten kids. Um, we, so we, it's a building block style. We don't just go to problem solving the first session, mm -hmm. right? So some of the skills that you need to go into a problem solving session is, is communication. So both active listening and articulation. Uh, you might need negotiation. Uh, what is a win-win? So what do I want and why? What do you want and why? And what are some of the possibilities that can come from it? Mm -hmm. That's negotiation. Um, we might need body language and um, being able to be aware of how much of the body language that we're communicating when we use our body and how we're standing and how we're approaching things. All those things feed into tone. So we can't just go straight into a body language without the building block components to go to problem solving. Huh. So if we had um, our common, we have blind man's adventure would be a common one that we would do, is that we would get people with blindfolds and horses. And the idea is, is trust and respect. If you put a blindfold on, is your partner gonna keep, your safe, keep you safe? In a, pet, in, a, in a ring with five horses and eight other kids. Huh. So we start off the exercise by, you know, what does trust look like for you? Or, and so they'll go in all, oh, they'll talk about a bit about what trust looks like for them. And then we'll go in and we'll say, okay, you're going to do a couple of exercises right here with your partner because you're going to develop trust. And then ready, you're going to go and get a horse and you're going to do these set of exercises with one person blindfolded. So usually there's a bit of shock and there's a bit of awe. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of fun. And they learn some skills about each other. It took me a lot to trust you because here I was blind and I walked right into the horse. <laughs> yeah. Right? But did your partner keep you safe? Yeah, he did. And what did it take for him to keep you safe? Well, it really helped when he told me that there was something on the ground in front of me that I should lift my leg. Mm. It me if he told me that in four or five steps, this is what we are going to. Well, that's all very interesting information when you take it back out into the real world. Yeah. 
some people like to be told the little things mm -hmm. and some people like to be given a bigger picture mm -hmm. and then go towards the picture like that important information and important information about yourself i felt really safe when so at the end of the exercise they take their their blindfolds off and we go back into the debrief and say how did things work for you mm -hmm. right don't tell me we try not to get them on the negative what worked for you today uh, it really worked when i was able to tell him that i didn't hear him when he was on the other side of the horse that he had to come over on this side and help me be able to hear him mm -hmm. how important is your hearing now that you're blindfolded right so that's one exercise there's there's many exercises we have a library of over 30 exercises that we draw from there's a main 12 a power 12 that we deliver pretty much and it, it's a building block again you're not going to start with problem solving without going through some of your communication components first i'm curious leah if you can expand on what makes horses such important teachers um, in in these programs oh good question that's a good one um horses live in the moment and they're prey animals <laughs> being that they're going to be uh, responsive to energy they're going to be responsive to intent and they're always going to have their senses taking in the entire environment when we come to our horse and we as horse people know this you get off the phone with the telephone company and you're you're upset and you're angry because something can't change and you go out and you try and catch your horse <laughs> and the horse is at the other end of the field going, uh, uh, I'm not coming anywhere near you. And why? Because they sense that your, uh, all of your energy is predatory in its sense. Mm. So they're going to feel that. So the opportunity for all us horse people, because we've done it, oh yeah, right. Okay, ground down. It's just a conversation that I've left in the past. Okay, let me think about this and then I'm going to approach my horse. And then he wants to approach you. So that's the feedback. So how can little Johnny be helped to be present in that moment in that day? Well, it depends on his experience coming up to that moment. Mm -hmm. And it depends on us going, wow, that's interesting. What do you think? you can do to be able to approach Mingo. He doesn't want anything to do with me. Right, so what do you think you can do to help him want to do, have something to do with you? Right, well, I can calm down because, yeah, maybe that would help. You got a partner. What are some of the tools that your partner brings to the, to the, to the experience? So because horses are so, um, you guys hear this? Give me uh, one second. <laughs> oh, editing. There you go. Um, because horses can sense the energy is coming at them to be able to determine the predatory um, energy that's coming at them, it allows us as humans to recognize when we are being predatory. Mm -hmm. uh, we as parents, we, we can get predatory very easily. Um, and we as horse people also believe too that the relationship with a horse is more of dominance. Well, it's not, it's leadership. There's a difference. Um, leadership is very important because from a safety standpoint, which horses will just compute safety, non-safe, predator, non-predatory, Pray. I'm out with my with my buds in the field. We don't sense anything. For to allow them to be in our presence, there's some there's a trust that's got to be there, mm -hmm. not a dominance. And so it allows us to recognize how we want to be a leader to lead a prey animal. And it's I believe it's one of the biggest. Um, privileges that we have hmm. and like i've as a as a 4-h parent and somebody who did a lot of stuff pre equine assisted learning life i remember walking through the barns at stock show in armstrong going the horses are 
flipping their ears and swishing their tails and and the kids were didn't even pay any attention to the nonverbal cues and I see that completely different now hmm. Hmm. so the other part about horses that makes them so important is that sometimes humans can impart their knowledge all the time a lot of people like to tell you how you think you should be doing things <laughs> and sometimes with kids especially they tune parents teachers out it's a little different when you're trying to tune out an 1100 pound animal mm -hmm. yeah i heard um oh i love this saying um uh go to people for opinions and horses for answers mm -hmm. but the answers are the opportunity for you to reflect on what you bring to the equation mm -hmm. right i i use this example a lot we were well i have a lot of examples um we had a kiddo that was i believe he was nine and um he had betty one of our really sensitive mares and he was ramming her through the exercise, not even paying any attention to his partner. And he was going, he was just doing whatever he could, get into the obstacle. And Betty's foot grazed his foot. Mm. He looked down for a moment and then kept going. Well, the next obstacle, he was ramming the horse through and it's a big horse. Like you can, on two feet, you can do, move things, but on four feet, it's like moving a truck. <laughs> right for somebody who's not used to moving trucks at nine years old well, <laughs> pull on stepped on or stepped on his foot to the point where he fell over mm. so skilled facilitators that we are we go over and sit and check and see if betty is okay ah. oh betty are you okay he's like what do you mean she stepped on my foot right oh betty you know you really didn't see it and you really couldn't see what was happening ah, and he couldn't believe that we had gone right mm -hmm. okay well do you want a hose on your foot so we hose his foot cools down well the next exercise he apologized to the horse because it was his fault mm -hmm. she can't see her feet so how is she gonna know mm -hmm. So it changed how he saw things. At this point, when in the first time that it happened, I'd gone up to the parents and I thought, okay, well, we'll see how this goes. The parent was elated at the fact that the kiddo didn't punch the horse. <laughs> and I was like, oh. And she goes, because if I would have stepped on his foot, he would have punched me. Uh. So it goes to perspective. Yeah. Um, you you could tell kiddo to, you know, don't run around because somebody's going to get hurt. Don't run around. You might get stepped on. Don't run around. This could happen. They tune you out. So the experiential learning process is allowing it to happen. Mm -hmm. Allowing it to happen and getting the learning from it when it does. Mm -hmm. We don't do a lot of that in per, in society anymore. And for the most part, there was no harm, no foul, right? Um, the, there was nothing broken. Had a hose on. We've all been had a horse's foot on our and will again. <laughs> yep. Um, and so, and the valuable learning for that kiddo was something that adults haven't hadn't been able to teach him up until then. Mm -hmm. or else his behavior would be different and he offered a valuable ex explanation to everybody he worked with for every program after that mm -hmm. you got to take your time with betty because she likes to be able to know where her feet are ah that's pretty cool that is pretty cool and the behavior was changed and I've got like I got countless experiences like that. And it, there comes the value of the facilitation. Mm -hmm. If we go to the if we go to the situation and feed into the negative attention, rather than make the choice at the positive attention to the horse, it allows the opportunity for reflection. 
-hmm. may not be instantaneous, may not be right at that moment. It depends upon all the other factors, but it certainly offers up the opportunity in the future for the personal accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability is a big part of what we do here because we allow these things to happen. He, he was warned to, right? He got the warning on the braise of the foot, didn't change his behavior. And I'm guaranteeing you that things were, we were trying to facilitate it, right? Johnny, what do you think you could do differently? Right? Not listening. <laughs> and so an outcome was there. The outcomes could be as easy as, you know, when I was able to breathe and I wasn't so nervous, the horse came up to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm sure we've all had experiences like that. Or we go out, you know, um, I have a sensitive horse on the property. If I go out and I'm in the wrong state of mind, I'm going, what's his problem? And then I take a moment to think about it. Oh, I'm the problem. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. his problem. <laughs> yeah, take a lap. <laughs> yep. <laughs> have some tea and then try again. <laughs> yeah. And that's the personal accountability that we learn. Um, and we have the privilege of learning with horses if we choose to learn it. It's not to say that every horse person has the ability to do what we do. For one, there's people who do training and who teach lessons that can't let the human development part come. Mm. We as horse people, and I've had them, where they, they come and they want to come and do this and they can't allow it to happen. We can see it happening and we as humans want to change the outcome. But where, where my horse is and what we do is allowing it because we know what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. We know that Betty would, was going to reasonably step on his foot. She wasn't going to stomp on it with a double foot and run away because we know the horses that we use. We, there might be some horses that would do that, but we know that it would be completely, it would be the right um, thing to do at the right time. And that's what horses are beautiful at. Mm. Their timing is impeccable. And that's the timing and the release is what teaches, right? That foot on that horse is not going to teach that kiddo anything, but taking the foot off and allowing the reflection, that's what teaches. Mm -hmm. So here's a question for you, Leah. Um, beyond possibly, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, a calm, stable, experienced horse, is there anything else that makes a... Um, that you look for in an equine assisted learning horse? Anything else that has to be special about these horses? Totally, lots. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we're taught in the training program to evaluate horses. It's a, one of the modules. Um, we evaluate them on a, on a scale, one, two, and three. One would be your bomb proof kind of horse. Two would be you know, moderate, mildly to moderately sensitive. And a number three horse would be sensitive. Anything on the outside of that is not safe. You need a percent of each in your program so that you can draw from them. Um, so my Betty horse that I talked about, about um, she would be a two, maybe a three horse. She's solid. Anybody can do anything with her. The problem with her, she's almost 30 and mm -hmm. she, she dissociates. She takes her, checks herself out. And so she's now been um, graded to a number three horse. She came from a number two horse. We've had horses that are number one horses. And then all of a sudden, because of a set of experiences, goes to a number two or a number three or out. Mm -hmm. It depends upon their experience. Um, we have a lot of people that want to donate horses to me, saying that they'd be make a really good therapy horse. Um, that's not always the case. One, they need to live uh, together for the most part. They need to be acclimatized in a herd. Mm -hmm. it's, there, there might be programs that, that take horses out of individual pens, put them all in an arena for a half an hour, let them sort it out, and then put a bunch of kids in there. That would not be my choice. My horses all live together or can live together because we just shuffle them around at all times. We as facilitators need to know the hierarchy of the herd we have. Last fall, we lost our lead mare, and it all shifted. Mm. 
So now the lead mayor is not as reasonable as the previous lead mayor. Um, she's an amazing horse and she's probably going to do great in the program, but it, things have shifted. So we as facilitators need to understand that and need to know so that we can offset it. And as, as we know, horses teach each other, the hierarchy is usually around food and water. A, domin a more dominant horse is not going to let a less, lesser horse eat or drink when they want to establish who's going to be on top. And if we have, we don't often have food in the, in the, um, in the arena or where we do what we do. But my horses are fed 24-7 anyway, so they don't have food-based issues. Um, they're not going to drive uh, others away because of perceived food or anything like that. So they have to live together. They have to be established on their one, two, or three score. We have to know that their phases, um, I think Pat Pirelli talks about phases very often. This is where I heard it many years ago, was that I need to know that what stimulus is going to come to that horse and what the response is going to be. If, if, if we have just a light stimulus and it's going to be a huge response, it doesn't mean I'm not going to use that horse. It's just going to mean that I need to know that. The response needs to be appropriate, head in the air, right? Rather than going to bite, head in the air, tail swish, up, up the phases, before there's a delivery of a significant impact. So we need to know that there's a time frame and what the time frame is between phases. We need to know that the horses don't carry a grudge. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do. Um, you can go up to one of the horses here and then she'll be bitey or whatever and then the next person will go up and she'll be bitey again because she got away with it. So we have to manage those behaviors sometimes and recognize whether or not she just doesn't have the capacity for many footsteps. And that's what I'm like, we talk about footsteps around here. There's a lot of horses that, that are do really well with just one on one or one on two, too many energies around them, right? Little dysregulated kid, really withdrawn kid, 10 kids and a lot of energies and they'll get, they can either shut down or it'll stress them out or any of those things. You need to, you need to be able to see those things. And we try and see them as much as we can. And, and their age, as they advance in age, sometimes they get desensitized by it or they could shut down from it. And those aren't really good from the horse, from the horses either. So they have to be able to give an opinion because a lot of overtrained horses don't step out and don't give an opinion because they've never been allowed to, that's not good either. Because we look for their opinion. Hmm. That guides us in what it is we do. So there's, there's a number of things and that's where rescue horses, rescue horses have a good value, but they have to be, they have to be rehabilitated in many respects to be able to do this kind of work so that they're safe, yeah. in my opinion. So it sounds like there's a lot that goes into the selection of the horses. Um, what makes a good equine assisted learning facilitator? Like, is there anything specific that, um, like a strength that one could bring to this work or um, like backgrounds that you see be more helpful than others? Um, not necessarily, because I think us horse people come from a ver variety of different backgrounds um, and, you know, um, professionals. I was, a, I was formerly a registered nurse, so professionals come from different backgrounds. Um, I think the biggest, if I was to name one thing that would stand out, is letting go of the outcome. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of people in the helping professions are attached to an outcome. If, if we do X, Y, and Z, this will happen. So we're gonna drive X, Y, and Z. Um, right. Yeah, so teachers, um, a lot of instructors, teachers, coaches, those kinds of things. You're and gonna want an outcome. You're gonna want the heels down. You're gonna, yes. Yeah. And 
uh, that is, I think, in my opinion, would be the, the one thing that I would look for, is are you able to trust the process and let go of driving an outcome? Because it, when you do that and allow it to happen, that's where the magic happens. Um, I think that's kind of cool how you said that. And it almost, I feel like a lot of our problems and maybe um, uh, with even within the social development part that you're talking about helping people with is being flexible enough to let go of agenda and let go of a bit of control um, and have that flexibility. So your horses need to have that, your facilitators need to have that, and then um, your the people you're working with, that sounds like it's part of what they're developing too. Yeah, we talk about uh, the pause. Um, when you don't know what to do, do nothing. Cool. Right? Allow space, and so the minute we, we go into a situation and we're observing something, we actually ask, we actually try and take a step back, pause, a breath, and then go. It'll allow a lot more clarity around what the intervention might be that you would choose or what the facilitation style you might choose. Allowing the pause, letting go of the outcome, and enjoying the process, right? Um, one of the things I enjoy the most is um, life is not a destination, it's a journey that's been something that's always been stuck in my head and that's the same thing with equine assisted learning and social development you, you you don't go at the end of the day and say my report card is communication installed articulation <laughs> right it's not success or fail it's a process and so if, if you've contributed to that process and allowed the opportunity for reflection you know what did you learn about communication there awesome right um those are very important things uh, you can't have articulation without active listening in our day and age people say well you i sent you an email just because you sent me an email doesn't mean i got it read it saw it i open emails all the time and i have to go back to them and say now what did that say right those are those are challenges with communication when technology is involved and they're the same challenges we deal with when we're face to face. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I got there for a second. What was that? Mm -hmm. But to be able to say that is a, is a confidence and a skill. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't say, I'm sorry, I missed that. Can you repeat that? So the other, one of the things with communication that we talk about all the time is that if, if, you start talking before the other person is done, you're going to miss three seconds of the thought. Hmm. One, two, three. Right. Then you were able to see the entire communication. Ooh. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You kind of already alluded to it earlier, um, but I'm wondering if there's any stories that kind of stand out for you. Um, just in your work over the years, just any that have really stayed with you? Tons. <laughs> Tons. Um, one of our first programs, um, one of our very first programs that we had, uh, we had a then 15-year-old um, kiddo, and uh, she came to our program. Again, right, it was 2011 or 2012. We didn't know what we were doing. Right, we just delivered the program, tried to stay true to the program, and so this kiddo comes, she's 15, doesn't want to wear a helmet. And so my partner at the time says, well, she's got to wear a helmet. I'm like, why? Right, is there a choice between the kid coming or not coming? If she, if she doesn't, if she has to wear a helmet, she won't come. So what's the problem? Let's let her not wear a helmet. And I'll watch her. I'll take responsibility for it. So she came. She refused to wear a helmet. Well, then all the other kids are not going to want a helmet. Wear a helmet. No, they won't. It's not how it's going to work. Just trust. Trust the process. So they come. All the kids put the helmet on. 
And, and this one refuses to wear a helmet and goes walking through to see if she's going to get a response from us. No response. So she goes through the exercise, no response. And then we had this exercise it's called driving for success. And where I become like a police officer and the horses are cars. So they get to choose the cars and they go through this highway and they, they're supposed to pick up a trot with a horse in hand. And I'm supposed to get them for speeding or going too slow on the highway. Well, so I go, woo, 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 go after her. Well, she runs away. She runs. She keeps going through the course, running away from the police officer. And so anyway, I catch her. I give her my little ticket or my accountability thing. And we have a good laugh and we carry on. And no, so no helmet. And I, I catch her, right? I wasn't going to let her get away with that. I had to catch her because that's the accountability piece. And so she went through the entire program, 12 sessions with us. She finished, which one of the things that the people in her care had identified that she'd never finish anything. Mm. Yeah. She came back again and volunteered with us. Aww. Yeah. The, the, the following year, she came back again and volunteered with us. And her favorite horse was my first horse, Mingo. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a lot of connection there. She became a youth worker because mm -hmm. we've been doing it that long now that these guys are adults the first ones <laughs> have and she came back to me when we bought this house and she came and we had tea and i said what happened and she goes accountability leah accountability i said what do you mean and she goes i don't know when and i d but she says i woke i woke up one day and that word just stuck out to me of what it was mm -hmm. and she says we need to be accountable for what we do Mm. everything that we do and she says and what you guys do and what your program has done for me that's what it was accountability wow. mm. and I was I brings tears to my eyes when I hear those kinds of stories and stuff but that's what she got mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. she needed to get yeah. and if I would have had an outcome in mind of what she should have gotten I would have failed her Mm -hmm. ah. she needed to get out of all the things that I presented her in those programs she needed to get what she needed to get her biggest tool going forward mm -hmm. so there's tons of stories like that we're we're just now getting to the point where you know our first kids are adults and in, in working roles and in communities now because mm -hmm. like that was 2011 that was nine years ago and she would have been 15 so she'd be 24. wow yeah so some of our first kids are having babies mm. right and so we see and we hear from them and and um there's a lot of stories like that like not i'm not hearing so many of those stories yet because we we don't see them as often they've moved on or done things like that but a lot of stories like us horse people will be horrified at this story but i'll tell it <laughs> um we had a kiddo that was um just very dysregulated and we have the you know the electric fencing stakes that we put the tape through yeah. so we use those to put our signs that says weave your horse through the through the pylons and at the end back up your horse three steps so these stakes that we put in the ground and put the sign on, well, he's in the, in the arena and he dysregulates. He's all done. He wants nothing to do with it. Well, he picks up a stake and he runs through the, the middle of the arena with a stake, like a, like a spear. Oh. And it was, it was like, cue the facilitators, right? Because we're not going to give him negative attention for this because that's what he wants. We all turn our backs to him mm -hmm. and form a circle around the kids that we do have, right? Because we're protecting the kids and the horses that we do have. He was on the outside. We just kind of formed a circle, turned our backs for it, gave him no, no energy for that whatsoever. He got to the end of the arena with the stake. Nobody was looking at him. All the kids are doing their exercises. All the facilitators, nobody's paying any attention. He puts the stake down. And went and then went back into the exercise um uh leah uh gabby told me who whom we whom we all know and love 
Um, and uh, for any listeners, listen to episode one with Gabby, who talks about uh, barefoot trimming, little plug. Um, she was telling me about how cool it was working with you and learning about like letting go of, of saying, you know, no, don't do that with your learners. Yeah, right? so we call it open-ended questions and we do these games with each other that if we ask each other questions when we're getting into the equine assisted learning season, because if we ask a question that's, that's giving us a yes or no answer, then we're not allowing for creativity and no is gonna be the common answer. Yeah. Right? So we, all, we often play these games about having open-ended question, right? Mm -hmm. so what do you think your horse is trying to tell you? Not, do you think your horse likes that? Difference. Mm -hmm. Because you're engaging conversation rather than just giving a yes or no and giving them an out. Mm -hmm. So what did you think your horse was trying to say when you did that? Right? Oh, mm -hmm. she really likes me. She likes it when I pet her. Yeah, I think so. Why do you say that? Right? Well, she puts her head down, she licks and she chews. Yeah, those would be all good signs, wouldn't they? There's a yes answer. So we try and stay away from there and we try and test each other when we have these conversations to make sure that we only ask questions that would be a lengthy and then not a yes or no answer. So open-ended mm -hmm. questions. That's, that's so cool. Um, I'm curious about your, uh, when you're working with kids and their parents are there, is it an interesting process for them to, you, I can see you're like, hmm. Totally, so early on we had the facilitator facilitators all in the in the um, in the ring with the horses and the kids next thing you know we got ourselves a parent issue <laughs> yeah so up on the yard we can hear the parents right and we're like what so i kind of saunter up there and i'm kind of listening right from a distance and i'm like holy cow so very soon after that we put a facilitator with the parents because mm -hmm. how can we support the kids if we don't plant the seeds of the social objectives with the parents? I didn't, I didn't learn how to be a parent with a manual. I, we did it by gosh or by golly and learned what works and what doesn't work. And thankfully I have a 20 year old who's happy to tell me what didn't work, <laughs> right? That's the experiential learning piece that we all have. So, if we take a facilitator and put the facilitator with the parents and say, look at what we see. This is what we see. Wow, look at Johnny here, watch, watch. Oh, he's gonna get stepped on. Oh, he got stepped on, imagine that. Allowing them the opportunity to see it from a distance and back away from it gives them skills too. Mm -hmm. And we've been told time and time again that it allows them to be better parents. Awesome. Because when we, when we were just delivering this to the kids, we were missing an entire piece. We had one of the parents earlier on, he said, with you guys telling us what you told us, I listened differently to my kid in the car on the way home from equine, mm -hmm. right? She was, she was telling her dad how uh, Pickles at the time didn't, didn't want to be touched or didn't want to work with this other kiddo because of this and this and this that was projection she was actually telling her dad that she didn't want to work with the other kid because of this this and this but felt uncomfortable to be able to say it so projected it from the horse mm -hmm. when he was able to see that and hear that he heard something different from his kiddo than he had heard before rather than you need to work with this kid because that's what you're supposed to do he heard that there was a discomfort around how that kid made his kid feel mm -hmm. So we're not only imparting the social skills to the kids in the pen with the horses, we're also putting a facilitator with the parents to teach them what it is we see. So it allows them an opportunity to see it. Plus it's good damage control because when the kiddo got stepped on, the parent saw it coming. Mm -hmm. Because right. we'd, we'd given them the education. There was a kiddo that got bit. Um, we don't allow that to happen because remember we know what our horses are capable of but in this particular case it was warranted and the family knew that it was coming we all knew it was coming and when it came we we're all prepared with what giving the horse the attention yeah 
And kiddo came back to us another four more times and tells everybody about it, but also tells that he wasn't paying attention. Hmm. And he wasn't listening to the horse. Hmm. So it's not, it's one of those things that, that it was completely prepared and everybody knew that it was going to happen and it needed to happen. And it wasn't devastating, but it was effective. Hmm. And not all interventions need to be that dramatic, but sometimes they do. Mm-hmm. But allow, trust the process, and then, you, and then drop the outcomes. We're not here for my outcomes. The outcomes are the kids. And they're going to come as they're meant to. Like our kiddo with the accountability, right? She got that out of what we offered her. Awesome. Sorry. So we've talked a lot about the kid programming. I'm curious if you can expand on, um, I believe it's a leadership program as well that you offer. Hmm. Um, yep. We, so we take the same building block curriculum and we can, we can like there's over 30 exercises so we can choose three or four and or we could do one uh, we've had teachers come on their professional development days we've had i think there was 34 teachers in our pen with with an exercise and, and it's a one and a half hour or two hour that's the smaller one and so they go through an exercise in this particular case the teachers are there's two courses and they have to cross each other and then there's five or six teachers in one group with one horse and one's blindfolded one can't touch one can't see uh one can't hear um and they're they've all got blindfolds everywhere and they and so the challenge is for the group to get to the objective to get to the end recognizing all their disabilities mm. Right. So there's a value there that like one of the times that I did it when we were practicing it, I took away my words. Hmm. Those who know me know that taking away my words is not one of my, my words are one of my stronger suits. (laughs) Why would I volunteer to take away my words? Well, it was a very good learning experience for me. Why did I do that? Hmm. We often find you know somebody in the group will have horse experience and they're not leading the horse they're on the end doing something else and so we say to them so did you guys so you have an opportunity to do this exercise so now you're going to do the exercise picking the best person for the job so then they go through the exercise and then we say well i'm curious to know you know i know that this person here has horse experience and why is she collecting the balls and not not negotiating with the horse Mm-hmm. choosing the best person for the job mm-hmm. so that's an example of one of the exercises that we do uh, we do um, smaller groups so oftentimes communication is very important in workplaces again articulation active listening those two pieces are very important in a workplace because again if if you, you're not attentive listener and an attentive listener is not just to the verbal words It's the posture, it's the tone, all those things are attentive listeners. So those typically improve workplaces is the articulation, um, communication exercises. Then we could do two or three. If if organizations contacted us for three, then we would do, you know, two personal skill exercises like boundary setting and uh, or space. Some people are, um, you know, encroach social space rules. Um, So we have an exercise that addresses that where people are often in too close to the bubble. We call it social distancing right now, but um, (laughs) those that's another social skill. People that are often too much in your face, too close to you. And then all of a sudden you're sitting there. I'm not getting anything that you're saying because you're too close. Social skill. So all those things are important objectives for us adults as well. Mm -hmm. So we work with the environment 
um, to find out which exercises we might choose. Hmm. There's a lot of work being done right now with compassion fatigue and empathy fatigue. That, you know, people that are involved in the helping professions don't have a lot to give. And it's often self-care and boundaries. Mm -hmm. Respecting others' boundaries and being able to identify your boundaries. I remember when I was a nurse, um, you know, uh, we were working many, many hours in the operating room. And when we were all done, we couldn't do it anymore. Um, oftentimes they would say, well, there is nobody else. There's no choice. Well, my boundary wasn't respected. And therefore, if it's done repeatedly, you could expect burnout in your workforce. All right. Um, compassion fatigue and empathy fatigue are very challenging things that people are dealing with in all the helping professions and other professions as well. Again, largely because boundaries aren't being identified and or respected. Mm -hmm. That's a social skill. Mm -hmm. I've so, heard, oh, go ahead, sorry. So our uh, leadership programs are a work that we do with the people that want us to do a program. Tell me a bit about your workforce. Tell me a bit about what your goals would be for you to come with us. And then a conversation takes place on which exercises we would do. Um, I heard, I've heard good things about your workplace. I've heard that you, um, you lead by example, Leah. Well, Gabby should really... <laughs> Gabby's been talking. No. She has. <laughs> um, I try because I know what it's like to, I live, I worked in a very hard workplace. Um, nurses are traditionally not, are very hard on each other, very good caring professionals, but can be very hard on each other. And I also know from example that um, when you're a leader of an organization or whatever it is, there's a very high uh, respect to that. And I take that very seriously. I take it really seriously. Um, I'm always trying to learn. I'm always trying to understand how to do it better. My workplace is a very difficult workplace. Um, energetically, to do one of these sessions with the kids can drain you out. Mm -hmm. You can't do this full time. No, I, I can't imagine doing this eight hours a day, five days a week uh, on a full year because it, it's exhausting. And in order to do that, you need to have the ability to support your workers. The other challenge with that is, is that at best, this is part-time employment. I can't frame it any other way that at best, this is part-time employment. And if you want people who are um, passionate about what they do and really want to do a good job, you need to offer them those opportunities. So education, support when what's whatever's going on in their lives and flexibility and if they don't eat i don't eat that's that simon sinek leadership um you know i'm not here to be uh served upon as the boss i'm here to make sure that they get out of what they want from the work that they're doing but at least and get supported in doing what they're doing it makes sense to me, mm -hmm. but it's a hard workplace. It's a hard thing to get. I mean, one of our, my brilliant, you know, two examples of brilliant facilitators, I, you know, I can't offer them full-time employment and their needs change and the family needs change and we might lose facilitators because of it. One of our other amazing facilitators um, didn't get permanent residency in Canada and had to leave. and. You know, she, she was amazing at this work. It's not something that you can do full time. And it's not something that we have in, in this climate where we have oodles of snow. It's not something that you're going to be able to do 52 weeks a year. So I take pride in trying to make the workplace something that they're coming here for too. Mm -hmm. Not just a job. They're very lucky to have you, Leah. Not every workplace is like that. <laughs> uh, it carries with it its frustrations, for sure. And trying to accommodate everybody for 
what is important to them and why they come here. Right. Well, I feel like we've just had an incredible overview of equine assisted learning as well as, you know, your journey. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to um, chat about before we end the interview? Uh, no, I, I always have an open door. Um, some of the people have, have uh, questioned me on that. And uh, they, they've, you know, some of the staff have said, well, you know, such and such wants to come because they want to do that. And I said, well, my door's open because this is not an easy thing to do. It's, it's not an easy thing to have so many footsteps on your property at all times. It's not an easy thing to support the families in all the processes that they're in because we have families that have experiences that we have no clue about. Mm -hmm. And it's not an easy thing to find the, your horse team mm -hmm. and to care for them as they age and to make difficult decisions. And so I have an open door if, if fellow people who are considering this or want to know what it is we do, um, call me, mm -hmm. come and talk to me. We have people all over the province that call me about how I shape the business and how we've done what we've done and what's worked and what's not. Because at the end of the day, we, if we support each other, we have a stronger community. Mm -hmm. We're supporting kids that'll eventually be in the workforce, that'll eventually be our coworkers and colleagues, that'll eventually be part of our communities. So to have an open door to fellow horse people or people who are considering doing this, is a natural fit and rather than if people want to do this and take this on then that's a good thing more work more opportunity for the horses to impart their wisdom and their power i think it's a it's a fit the other thing that we do is we also have um excuse me again editing <laughs> Um, the other thing that we do is we provide placement opportunities for social work, uh, human service work, uh, students at Selkirk College. Mm. Um, we're also having, well, we're supposed to have a teacher, uh, from UBC this year come and do a practicum with us. Um, we have volunteer options to help the kids get, uh, financial funding. So we do recycling. We have a number of things that would help support kids to come to this environment that would otherwise not be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. So we have multiple areas um, rather than just the service delivery. Um, and so it's important um, for people to know that it's not just one avenue that we have here. And that if they have any questions, I'm usually available to talk about it kind of something I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so if someone's feeling either passionate to learn more or wants to hear about your next fundraising opportunity because they want to support um, a little, little Oasis Equine, how do they get hold of you? Where should they find you? Are you on social media? Um, go ahead and promote. Uh, well, I'm not great on social on social media. I have people that do that for me. <laughs> uh, we have a Facebook page, Little Oasis E A L L O E A L. Uh, we have a website, littleoasisequine.com, and I can also be reached at two five zero three six eight two zero zero two. And I'm open to hear any questions. A lot of our fundraising is uh, comes from the Facebook page. We also have an Instagram page, but one of the facilitators manages that. I'm not terribly techie. A lot of ways to get in touch with us. Great. Excellent. Well, um, Leah, thank you so much. This is wonderful. You're very welcome. It's so glad informative. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we were finally able to pull it off. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. Um, for our listeners out there, uh, we've been working to make this happen for a while and I don't think it will disappoint. This is a wonderful interview. Oh, thank you very much, you guys. Um, thank you for the time and recognizing the work that we do. We're, we're very proud of what we do and we're very proud of what we mean in the community. So um, thank you for uh, hearing our story. 
Our pleasure. Well, um, Mira, is that a wrap? I think that's a wrap. <laughs> if you want more Friends on Horses, you can find us on Facebook at Friends on Horses Podcast. Check it out for all the latest and greatest horsey news. You can find us on the web at friendsonhorsespodcast.com or Instagram at friendsonhorses underscore podcast. Like what you hear? Help us quit our hay jobs by supporting Friends on Horses. You can support us by rating our episodes on iTunes. Becoming an ongoing sponsor through Patreon. Or simply by spreading the word about our show. Have some feedback? We'd love to hear from you. Contact us via email at friendsonhorses at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. <laughs>